Good evening and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channel's television and Millicent Walk out first, the highlights. Kaduna State Government sets October 31st as deadline for vaccination of federal civil servants and compliance to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Jigawa State Government moves to provide water across its local government areas to prevent infectious diseases spread. And American President Joe Biden announces vaccination of 5 to 11-year-olds as soon as Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is approved for the exercise. And according to reports, India has delayed committing supplies of vaccines to the COVAX global sharing effort. On Monday, in the run-up to an October 26 meeting on COVAXIN, India's first uh, domestically developed COVID-19 vaccine, the World Health Organization said it could not cut corners in the approval decision. The WHO said the agency could not cut corners uh, to approve that vaccine. The world's biggest vaccine maker resumed exports of COVID-19 doses this month for the first time since April, sending about 4 million to countries such as neighboring Bangladesh and Iran but none to COVAX. Well, meanwhile, 2.4%, that is over 2 million Nigerians, have been vaccinated so far, while only 4.8% have received their first shot. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control says the country recorded 159 new cases of COVID-19 in 11 states and the FCT, which also recorded the highest infections. Let's take a look at the virus update. 159 additional persons in Nigeria have tested positive to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. According to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the latest figures were reported from 11 states and the FCT, indicating an increase from the figures reported earlier. FCT logged the highest infections with 71, followed by Lagos with 20, Imo with 17, while Rivers had 15. Cross River recorded 9, Kanu and Undo had 7 each, Plateau had 4, Ekiti and Niger registered three each, Delta had two, and Bauchi had one case. There were no cases reported from Edo, Oyo, Ogun, and Oshun. The latest update also includes a backlog of cases from the FCT and Lagos State and 130 discharges from Oyo. The new tally has increased the total confirmed cases in Nigeria to 209,546. 234 patients have been discharged in the last 24 hours increasing the total number of recoveries to 197,546. Lagos accounts for the state with the highest number of cases currently on admission, followed by FCT, Delta, Oyo, and Akwaibom. There were no deaths recorded from COVID-19 complications in the last 24 hours, leaving the fatality toll at 2,838. Currently, there are more than 9,000 active cases in Nigeria, while over 3 million samples have been tested. More than 5.3 million eligible Nigerians targeted for vaccination have received their first dose, while over 2.7 million persons have been fully vaccinated. In Africa, there are more than 8.4 million confirmed cases and over 216,000 deaths have been recorded across countries on the continent. The total global confirmed cases have surpassed 241 million, while deaths are beyond 4.9 million. And over to Kaduna State, where the government has warned that anyone who wishes to enter any of its offices must comply with COVID-19 protocols, such as wearing the face mask and vaccination, as from the 31st of October 2021. The government reiterated that the Ministry of Health has since commenced the vaccination of all civil servants, which is expected to be completed by that date. In a statement issued by the Special Advisor on Media and Communication to the Governor, Mr. Muiwa Adikeye, Visitors to government offices will need to present their vaccination cards. And given the limited supply of vaccines currently available, visitors that have not yet been vaccinated will in the interim be permitted entry upon presentation of evidence of registration with the State Ministry of Health for the purpose of vaccination. The risk of mass infection by COVID-19 remains high. Uh, this necessitates that the state government must continue to pay careful attention to the continued enforcement of preventive measures and encouraging residents of Cardinal State to practice personal responsibility more consistently. 
Uh, this is in line with the forward campaign. The government launched late in 2020 to help citizens adopt preventive measures as the state reopened after months of lockdown. So while Kadnasi government continues to encourage compliance with um, these public health measures, it would also, from 31st of October 2021, require face masks and vaccination as conditions for access to its offices. Um, our State Ministry of Health has since commenced the vaccination of civil servants, and we expect that this will be completed by the 31st of October 2021. All civil servants are, of course, required to be vaccinated by that date. Uh, visitors to government offices will also need to present their vaccination cards. We are aware that given the limited supply of vaccines that are currently available, uh, visitors may not all have been vaccinated by that date. Therefore, those that have not yet been vaccinated will be permitted in, in the interim to present evidence of registration with the Ministry of Health for the purpose of vaccination while wearing their face masks whenever they come. Staying in the northern region, safely managed water, sanitation and hygiene services are an essential part of preventing and protecting human health during infectious disease outbreaks, including the current COVID-19 pandemic. One of the most cost-effective strategies for increasing pandemic preparedness, especially in resource-constrained settings, is also investing in core public health infrastructure, including water and sanitation systems. While well, the Commissioner of Water Resources, Ibrahim Hanungewa, disclosed this in Dutse, the state capital of Jigawa, where he says the state government is trying to ensure that every community gets access to portable water. Regular hand washing has been identified as one of the key measures in preventing the spread of COVID-19. This is why Jigawa state government is making it a priority to improve access to water in every community. For the COVID-19 and uh, these uh, waterborne diseases like cholera, we are doing our best. Because as I told you, we constructed about 440 something solar, which you don't need foil, you don't need uh, uh, service of the generator, you don't need even generator. So our idea is that by the end of this government, 60 to 90 percent of the water scheme in Jigawa will go on solar. The chairman of the Civil Society the Forum, Musbahu Gosirka, believes that, that there is need for more enlightenment on the proper way to wash hands. Use of water and washing hands is very essential and is uh, very, very important and also paramount in preventing not only the COVID-19 pandemic and, also, uh, and other diseases such as cholera and what have you. But I think um, we need to know that, yes, of course, need, people need to be enlightened in the importance of washing hands after a uh, toilet or after walking and alter, after they have been uh, doing work and after some issues, then they need to use uh, detergent and water to wash their hands. But he also like, proceeds to give a demonstration. Have, you pour a detergent like this, you put rope your hands, you rope your hands regularly, regularly rub your hands, make sure that you touch everywhere, wash these fingers, wash this, and also pour the water to separate this is how, is it, how it is. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, Jigao State has recorded 597 cases with about 16 fatalities. Regular hand washing cannot be overemphasized or replaced in the chain of activities necessary for prevention of infectious diseases. Sadiq Ilyasu, Channel's Television News. And according to health experts, global health funding approaches, politicization of the pandemic, including political blame game, uh, mistrust of government and other institutions, and a lack of robust accountability measures are some of the pandemic response obstacles. But they also say that COVID-19 has presented an opportunity for a collaboration that may potentially strengthen global solidarity. Where is Nigeria with its capacity building institutions and agencies in tackling the pandemic and other infectious diseases? Well, joining us is a public health physician, Dr. Alero Roberts, who joins us virtually. Welcome to the program. 
Thank you very much for having me. So the COVID pandemic threw up gaps in Nigeria's health system, as with a few others around the globe, but defining uh, essentially a new direction that countries must take to achieve self-sufficiency in pharmaceuticals or research, name it. So far, what have you seen that we are doing in this regard? That's a very good question and one that um, has had us thinking quite a bit in the last few weeks and months. The gaps that the COVID-19 pandemic showed up in the health system are really rather cogent. And the problem is that when we're now looking at this 2022 health budget, you know, the, the real issue is going to be human resources for health. How do we continue to retain them? How do we recruit them? How do we retrain them? How do we keep, remunerate them? Because the, there's no doubt that the loss of our human resources for health to higher income countries or you know, places with better working conditions is really quite dire. And this is across board. This is not just talking about the doctors. We're talking about the nurses, the physiotherapists, the pharmacists, the medical lab scientists. We're losing them all. And I would honestly wish that if I had a magic wand, we would seriously deploy at least the Abuja Declaration 15% of the budget to the health sector so that the entire the entirety of the health sector can be strengthened. But with regards to what you've mentioned, um, human resources, that also is affecting some of our institutions because then they are leaving those institutions um, maybe almost empty. So in terms of perhaps what we must do. Um, a lot of the times, um, I think we've said that there have been several multiple healthcare policies, um, several interventions from government, um, private sector, but how do we bring all of these interventions into reality? The truth of the matter is we just need the administration to keep their promises. There have been enough policies that have been formulated. There, are, you know, you can't implement a policy without people. And you know, you make a promise to people and you don't keep it, and you do that consistently time over time, you completely erode the trust people have in any institution or in any administration. And therefore you have massive, beautiful teaching hospitals all well laid out and no people to staff them. The, the administration simply has to keep their promises. MOUs that have been signed, agreements that have been signed need to just be kept. It's very simple. Now, looking at some of these agencies, and this is in the wake of, you know, zeroing in on how we've handled COVID-19 since our first case, um, how would you say they've performed? Um, NAFDAG, NIPRID, um, NIMA? Without the data, it's very difficult to say. I'm not going to sit here and speculate and say they've done well or they haven't done well. You know, in terms of, um, well, NAFTAC has done well, to be honest, because they've been really up to par on um, checking the validity of the vaccines, checking the validity of uh, treatment claims and debunking when they need to be debunked and debunking them quite seriously based on science. Um, we've probably done a lot better than we expected, particularly in the production of healthcare consumables because of the jam we had in the logistics supply chain. But without cogent data that has been published, it's very difficult to make a, a statement and say, yes, we've, we're benchmarked against international organizations, we're here or there. So I won't speculate, no. Okay, to quickly get your thoughts as we wrap up, NIPRID recently told us two out of four, um, I think that's the medicines um, for the treatment of COVID-19 are undergoing clinical trial. Are you optimistic about this? Oh, very optimistic, absolutely. Because they'll be doing clinical trials according to international protocols. Nobody would dare do anything less than uh, international uh, best practices. So yes, I'm very optimistic about it. And the next okay. question is whether we can produce it in country. That will be that will be absolutely fantastic if we can produce them in country. All right, Dr. Larry Roberts, thank you so much, and safe, uh, be safe as you head um, onwards. Um, thank you so much for joining us thank on the you. program. Thank you very much. Okay. Still to come, unvaccinated workers across the U.S. are facing potential job losses. Stay with us.
and thousands of unvaccinated workers across the United States are facing potential job losses as a growing number of states, cities and private companies start to enforce mandates for inoculation against COVID-19. This is also as the U.S. is days away from vaccine approval for children ages 5 to 12 and the countries continue to work towards full vaccination for all Americans over the age of 12. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird has more. The White House has announced that on November the 8th, it will lift 21 months of historic COVID-19 travel restrictions for fully vaccinated international visitors to the U.S. This news comes as the White House reported that vaccine rates are steadily increasing in the U.S. We've made tremendous progress across the past nine months. As of today, 77% of eligible Americans those 12 and older have gotten at least their first shot. And thanks to the president's leadership on vaccination requirements, we continue to make important progress. More than 3,500 organizations, from healthcare systems to educational institutions to state and local governments to private businesses, have already stepped up to adopt vaccination requirements. These vaccination requirements have increased vaccination rates by 20 plus percentage points, with organizations routinely seeing their share of fully vaccinated workers rise above 90 percent. Despite the promising news of an increase in vaccinations across the U.S., pregnant women are still struggling with whether or not to get vaccinated. So for them to tell you to your face that he's um, you know, there's no heartbeat and that there's no movement because um, he did pass away already. That was news that I was not expecting to go into the hospital in here. I honestly wish I would have asked more questions um, about it um, because I think that looking back, I'm, you know, I know that I did everything I could have possibly done to give him a healthy life. But the only thing I did not do that I will have to carry with me is that I didn't get the vaccine. So I don't know how that could have changed everything. So I have to live with that unknown. The U.S. leads the world in the number of available vaccines, but continues to struggle with reaching herd immunity amongst Americans, a critical step toward eradicating the virus. From Washington, Maria Bird, Channel Television News. And Maria Bird is with us now, joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Maria. First, it's heartbreaking what happened to Kendall, who lost her unborn baby. Um, pregnant women, should, there, should they be vaccinated? What's the advice? Good evening. Yes, that story is one that I think can hit home to anyone, uh, whether or not you have children or know people that have children. Uh, that uh, individual there and many other women who are pregnant, unfortunately, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, many were unsure whether or not it was safe for pregnant women to receive the vaccine. And I think the myth around that has continued despite the fact that the CDC and health professionals and scientists have stated that the vaccine is healthy for the mother of the um, unborn child. And also it obviously assists the unborn child if the unfortunate case of the mother contracting the virus. And if they're vaccinated, obviously that then um, allows for the symptoms and the potential cause of hospitalization, or unfortunately, in this case, the death of the unborn child. So essentially, the advice is that pregnant women should get vaccinated. Correct. Yes, that is it, the advice of the health professionals in the U.S. So on the flip side, there's good news coming that a lot of vaccination is progressing, 70-something percent. However, people are also reacting to organizations that appear to be stepping, stepping up uh, the vaccination mandates. Yes, the vaccination mandates um, are beginning to sweep through uh, the country. I think that when you hear of cases like we just did of uh, pregnant women who are not choosing to vaccinate, when you think about the children 
that still are waiting for vaccine approval. Uh, when you think about the elderly, I mean, we just recently lost uh, General Colin Powell to complications. I mean, we must be clear that he had a compromised immune system. But the reality is, if we had herd immunity in the U.S., um, then potentially uh, you would not have seen someone to have received complications of the virus. And so, um, you know, we are in a position, I think, where the government and various corporations are don't have much of a choice because they're seeing the death tolls continue, even though they're not at the rates they were uh, several months ago and over a year ago, uh, they we are still seeing deaths at the hands of the coronavirus. What is the state of unvaccinated workers across the states facing potential job losses? That is a real issue. I mean, we've seen the state of New York, uh, which they put mandates in place for health professionals um, and nurses protesting against losing their jobs as a result of not wanting to be vaccinated. And so what you will begin to see is you'll then begin to see an increase in unemployment rates, joblessness claims. Uh, the question, though, is how will the government respond uh, to jobless claims from individuals who have lost their job as a result of not taking the vaccine? Will they be able to receive the same unemployment benefits? Um, and will jobs be required to pay certain amounts toward unemployment for those individuals? So we're uh, facing quite a, 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 um, a fork in the road as it relates to that. Um, you'll also begin not only the health fields, you'll begin to see that in the school systems. We've already began to see that teachers being mandated uh, to get vaccinated. And in the private sector as well, um, non-governmental organizations. So this is going to definitely potentially impact the economy, but most importantly, it's going to impact the everyday American's household who potentially could be seeing a drop in income as a result of it. All right, Maria, for children, how close are they, vaccination approval for under 12s? It is actually, we're now at, what is this, October the 20th? Um, they were expecting this uh, vaccine, uh, the emergency authorization to occur sometime at the end of October. So we're 10, 11 days away from the end of October. Uh, they were expecting sometime mid-November to actually be putting shots in arms for children. So I would say either the next time we speak or the time uh, shortly thereafter, uh, before the beginning of the next month, we will probably know the exact date of when children will be able to begin to get vaccinated and the emergency authorization will likely uh, occur um, in a very short time period. Thanks, Maria. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, there for us. Thank you for having me. Then President Uhuru Kenyatta has lifted the nationwide dusk to dawn curfew effective immediately. Ms. Uhuru made the announcement today during the 58th Mashuja Day celebrations at the Wanguru Stadium in Kirinyaga County. He announced Kenya as of today, had vaccinated 5 million adults, noting as well that the rate of COVID-19 had decreased over the last two weeks, characterized by a positivity rate of below 5%. Is thanking the people of Kenya for exercising admirable degree of civic responsibility in the fight and being their brother's keepers. Here's more on the global COVID-19 update. The announcement about the vaccination for children aged 5 to 11 was made by the Biden administration, which says this will be possible as soon as the COVID-19 shot is approved for younger children by the FDA. If Pfizer Incorporated and BioNTech SE's vaccine wins wider approval, the plan would ensure the U.S. would be ready to ship 15 million doses within the first few days. Across the pond, the National Health Service in the UK is close to the edge of being overwhelmed in many parts of Britain and the pressure is only going to increase as winter approaches, so says the head of the system's body, Matthew Taylor. Britain reported 223 deaths from COVID-19 on Tuesday, the highest daily figure since March, and cases are the highest in Europe. The Prime Minister has lifted almost all COVID-19 restrictions in England and is keeping measures such as mandatory mask wearing common in much of Europe, in reverse, only as a plan B. Latvians are divided over COVID-19 vaccines in a month-long lockdown measure that will take effect on Thursday. Some residents say they regret the country's current situation and say the government is to blame. On Tuesday, Latvia announced it would bring in a COVID-19 lockdown from October 2nd until November 15th. 
to try to slow a spike in infections in one of the least vaccinated European Union countries. And therefore, given the progress in containing this disease... Finally, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta has announced the lifting of the dawn-to-dusk curfew that was imposed last year to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The curfew has been in place from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. since March 2020, when Kenya's first cases were confirmed. In the same regard, and by the authority vested in me as president, I hereby order and direct that the nationwide dust to dawn curfew that has been in effect from the 27th of March 2020 be and is hereby vacated with immediate effect. Kenyatta says the move is due to progress made in containing the virus. Remember that COVID-19 is not malaria. Continue to visit the a sample collection centre near you and take responsibility. You can visit our website. It's channelcv.com for latest breaking stories, today's news, and of course, news from around the world. That's the programme this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antworoka. Stay healthy.